30 times. Ten times more. Two times more. Letting go and stop. Observation, you're like, whoa, what do your colleagues say in academia? Well, they looked at me as a weird kind of guy, you know, because everybody was in the genes. Genes were the, you know, that was before the genome project. That was the building up of our genetic repertoire of like, everything's genes. And I'm the only guy out there in the corner going, it's not the genes. Uh, and they looked at me like the only guy out there in the corner and sort of dismissed it because it didn't fit their conventional story. As a matter of fact, the first time I gave a lecture on it in front of my colleagues, uh, I had left the university, but I come back because I needed a scientific audience to, to describe what I was working on. Uh, at the end of my talk, I said, thank you very much. And this room full of people, they just stared at me for, it was dead silent. I, I felt like really crazy. I was in front of the room. I said, thank you. And it just stared at me. Uh, and one guy in the back of the room, I remember he went <laughs> twice. I, I mean, it was so clear. And when he did that, everybody looked at him. And then he just put his hands down in his lap. And then about a minute later, they all stood up and they walked out, all my colleagues. Uh, and, they, and I thought I was crazy. I, Why does this happen? Why <laughs> does that kind of thing happen? Because we think science is fact, but science is based on what's in vogue, right? And it's based on trends and all of that stuff, going back to Galileo or any of these things. Uh, right? Every time a scientist has come up with a new idea, that scientist was always claimed as being weird or crazy or you know way off track. And then those new ideas come in. Howard Temin, or sometimes uh, they're just the weirdo. Well, yeah, well, that's where you got to have to distinguish. <laughs> right. so where, where does weirdo leave off and, and, and you know, interesting person begin? Okay. Uh, and the fact was this. My research was repeatable every day, and you could predict it. The point about that is in science, prediction means you understand something. If you can predict it before you do it, then you have some insight. My predictions were always accurate. It just didn't fit the conventional storyline. Uh, and there was a choice. Um, you know, recant, you know, you're a heretic, you know, recant and just say, okay, it was wrong. And I said, no, every time I was looking around, it, the results were coming in in different ways from different places. So I held on to that. And it took about 20 years before science owned what I was talking about and gave it the name epigenetics. That's the new science. Thirty times.
Ten times more. Two times more. Letting go and stop. Okay, which is the belief that through your behavior you can kind of alter your genetics, pass those on, express it differently. I'm probably using the wrong words. Well, but pretty close right now. People talk about it as a reality, although it's still not totally understood or totally believed. I, uh, well, but it can I, be replicated. It, it is now. It, okay. it, it is a science. It's okay. a hard science, and it, it's the leading edge. Now, I, I'll tell you where the problem comes from. Not so much the scientists, but the pharmaceutical industry. And the reason why this becomes important is because the pharmaceutical industry uh, runs the show in medicine. And uh, if you could put this kind of healing that I'm talking about into a capsule or tablet, they'd be talking about it right now. But this is a consciousness healing, and, and you can't sell it. And so what's the result? They're not interested in it. And they, through their money, which is massive, actually determine the curriculum in a medical school. Uh, and the idea is, well, what's relevant? Well, if you understand epigenetics, you don't need the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And all of a sudden it's like, well, that's not in the interest of the, you know, one of the biggest industries on this planet to say, you can heal yourself without drugs? And I go, absolutely. For people that don't understand that concept, and I do because people have talked about it on London Real before, but talk to me about how the pharmaceutical companies can control the discussion in the entire medical industry. And would most doctors agree with that, first of all? And second of all, how do they do it? Well, first of all, the, how do they do it is money. Money is big. Money, uh, if I give grants, you can study what I'm going to give you a grant for. So they direct a lot of research with their billions and billions of dollars. And, uh, and it was actually interesting, the British Journal of Medicine uh, had a, a review uh, looking at the same research and determining if, if the research was funded by government money or the research was funded by private money, like pharmaceutical agency. The results came out four to five times more in the favor of the private industry when they paid for it, as compared to when it was just government money uh, without any special interest behind it. So right away, there's a manipulation of the data. You go, well, you mean these guys are cheating? I go, well, they're selecting the data to fit. Why? Because if I'm getting a grant and I write back, I say, sorry, pharmaceutical, I checked all your stuff and it doesn't work. Uh, I'm not going to get another gram from them. So are the doctors lying? Well, they're not lying, but they, they pick data that okay. supports their point. So they already have a conclusion before they even did the experiment. Okay, even in a double-blind study. Yeah, that's a, there's no such thing as a double-blind study. Okay, because no. people bring their own preconceptions to any study. Absolutely. And maybe even the pharmaceuticals are choosing which things to fund because they know they'll get the results. Absolutely. Thirty times. Ten times more.
Two times more. Letting go and stop. Absolutely, and one of the things they're trying to get rid of are people who respond to the placebo effect because the placebo effect throws the data right off the chart. Uh, a, a simple fact is this, and people are, might be upset, but the, the, the drugs like Prozac uh, in laboratory tests are no better than a sugar pill. And that's how many billions of dollars a day on this planet are spent buying Prozac yes. or statin drugs. Statin drugs help less than 3% of the people that take them. And in fact, they cause uh, side effects that are dangerous in about 23%. So you help 3% with a drug, 23% are getting toxic from the drug. Uh, and, and the idea is these are drugs that, uh, how long do you take statins? How long do you plan to live? Yeah. It's like, oh my God, that's a, you know, uh, they're drug they're dealers. They're cash cows. They're they drug, are drug dealers. dealers. They're good drug dealers. And I would call you out on placebo effect, but this has been well studied. You know, 60 Minutes has done things about that. One, you know, a third of the cases isn't far off for, you know, it, it having a benefit on the sugar pill. So Absolutely. We, we know that's true. And when I talk to people I know in the States, my family members, my relatives, my dad, I'm like, what's going on? And he's, oh, I'm on this statin. I'm on this oh. cholesterol drug. I'm on this. I'm, on this. I'm like, really? Is there something that wrong with you? Like, everyone's medicated there. Uh, yeah, it's pushed beyond any belief because, it, look, it's advertised every 10 minutes on television. There's a new drug or a drug, and it's put into their heads like, your life's not working right? <gasps> this drug, look at the happy people. See, they've taken the drug and how happy they are. And people buy that story, and, and, and drugs kill uh, over 300,000 people a year. Pharmaceutical drugs kill about 300,000 people a year. Uh, and everybody says, oh, 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 that's just the cost of doing medicine. And yet they have a war on drugs, which kill less than 30,000 people a year. And all of a sudden you got a war because 30,000 people died. 300,000 people died. That's, that's business as usual. It's like, wow. And most people would blow their mind with those stats, but I think you're probably right. As in this whole huge war on drugs we have around the planet, all of the overdoses, all of the shocking stories and the things you see in movies, 30,000 deaths versus 300,000 due to pharmaceutical drug death. Prescribed. Prescribed yes. by a doctor, but, yes. that ad that you saw on television, yes. and then you have it. Yeah, that says a lot. Now, how can they actually control the discussions in medical schools? It's one thing if they control the studies. How can they control what people are talking about, what where people does, are teaching? Where does funding come from? Where does money come from in a medical school? Who gets paid? Doctors get paid. They get paid to prescribe drugs. They have these young women, you know, that you pick, who are the drug reps? You look at them, you line them up, there's a few guys over there, but most of them are all these pretty young women. Why? They walk in a lab, give a smile, uh, here's, here's some samples, hand these out, and, and the next thing you know, then the doctor is prescribing their patients to those drugs. That's, there's a story, there's even movies about that, okay? That's a real story. 